You're listening to the Decentered Media Podcast with me, Rob Watson. Conversations about community media. Visit decentered.co.uk or follow on Instagram and Twitter at Decentered Media. Hello, Rob Watson here of Decentered Media. And a couple of weeks ago, the 19th of November, I attended the UK CRN conference in Bedford. Uh, the theme of the conference was connecting communities. And I was part of a panel discussion about de- the potential deregulation of community radio. And I spoke to a number of people through the day, as well as the panel discussion that we had uh, with uh, Joe Coleman, Martin Steers and Sam Hunt. I also spoke to Jessica Memon from Rock Radio, sorry, Rock Raw Radio, and Leona Fenson from Inkslingers Media. And I managed to have a conversation with Ian Dale of LBC. Uh, I've put them together in uh, some kind of order here and uh, really thinking about what the impact is of deregulation and why the values of community radio need to be protected in order that community radio can not just survive, but thrive in the future. Um, To advocate on behalf of the sector, launching days like hashtag support community radio. 100 stations came together that day. We trended higher than Joe Wooks on social media when he was doing those daily fitness challenges. We've also represented the sector to Ofcom, DCMS, and various government departments, as well as appearing at the DCMS Select Committee earlier this year to advocate on behalf of community radio. Um, around a year ago, some of you were there at Coventry. We formed as a community interest company to help us leverage up those small uh, So I'm Martin Steers. I'm one of the directors and founders of the UK Community Radio Network, and I'm here today helping put the conference together. And then this evening, we have the Community Radio Awards, of which I'm also the founder and the chair as well. So our theme of our conferences are sort of connecting communities. The real root of what community radio is all about is being there for their local communities, whether that's communities of interest, um, particular niche communities, or whether it's just for the wider local community, particularly over the last you know, 10, 15 years that we've seen a... a I don't want to say the death, but the the moving away of what was traditional local radio, whether that's being commercial or now with the BBC, and where community radio can sort of step into those voids and provide, you know, fantastic local radio that, you know, informs, entertains and engages a community in their local area. So one of our big aims with the UK Community Radio Network is about bringing people together to network, share ideas, share best practice. You know, we, we shouldn't be working in isolation as a sector. We should all be sharing what we do so that other people can learn from it. You know, through our monthly managers meetings, loads of ideas have been shared, ideas that in my own community radio station I've taken from other people and adapted. People have taken my ideas and adapted in their stations. You know, we're all trying to serve a common purpose, which is serve our, our communities. Um, and it is about doing that collaboratively and supporting supporting each other and, and that's one of the main ethos of the UK Community Radio Network and the conference is, is, is more just a pinnacle of that really bringing you know some great keynotes and some great panel discussions to talk about you know everything from commercialization or you know how can you generate an income and do social gain to you know how can you do Christmas programming uh, uh, training uh, and all sorts of different ideas uh, and you know what what hopefully inspire community radio stations from across the country uh, to take some of these ideas away today and put them into practice in their own stations from we've got some fledgling sort of internet community stations all the way up to some quite big established community stations everyone is here to learn everyone is here to network and and there's an element even in the daytime there's an element of people here to sort of celebrate and champion what's great about community radio the awards as ever is going to be a fantastic night we're expecting sort of over 200 people Uh, to really showcase the best of uh, uh, community radio across across the UK. Uh, Some great entries, a fantastic, you know, quality of entries. And actually one of the things I'm going to be saying tonight is uh, the the judging process for some of the categories has been excruciatingly hard uh, for, for, you know, for the the judging, you know, the the numbers in terms of the scoring. Um, And it's great to see, as ever, the quality of the entries just grow and grow and grow. We're really keen to reach out to more stations. You know, it's one of the, the goals of the Community Radio Awards is, is to get more and more stations involved. We, we normally have around 20, 25, 30% of 
of um, eligible stations enter and I'd love to get that over 50 uh, percent and it's about reaching out to stations that maybe haven't heard of us or maybe don't think it's for them or, or what's the benefit of being involved in the awards process and it's if anything it's an opportunity for presenters and show teams uh, for volunteers and for stations to reflect on what they do and shout about it you know it's not necessarily about you know national glory it's about the opportunity to reflect very often in community radio because you're doing it every day day on day you never take that chance to stop and look back how much good have you done for your community on air off air over the past weeks months and year and and i've always said that the community radio award should be a catalyst to encourage stations to do that and then shout about that locally um, and then if they can get a nomination and if they can or if they can win a, a bronze silver gold um, then that can really help and we've seen a lot of stations where they've come back a couple of years afterwards and said look this opened doors with funders it got you know coverage from local papers from the local press councils mayors mps so it, it's a good way of you know ch- ch- championing and celebrating what community radio does uh, across the uk so I'm really torn on this because as somebody who's a big advocate for the BBC, I used to work in BBC local radio for a couple of years and I, and I, I know the power of, of local BBC and, and the place, the role it plays, the role it plays with the funding it has that community can't have in terms of its journalistic output. So there's part of me that says this is, this is going to be a real shame for local communities. But there's a part of me that says this is an opportunity for community radio to, to, to step up and fill those gaps. Um, I mean, if where I'm based uh, in the three counties area, I'm based in you know Bedfordshire. This is sort of the, my home conference and awards. You know we've got three CR, which is an absolutely massive coverage area, and in and some of the towns and villages in the patch gets hardly any coverage. So you know I've always questioned whether BBC is local radio. I've always said it's more county, or if not quasi regional kind of radio. So there's always been that gap in terms of local voice and local platform. But that gap's going to be even bigger when they these stations then become you know regional or even national programming so there is an opportunity for community radio there's also an opportunity for community radio and the bbc to be working together and how can we fill some of those gaps and and dare i say it ways from the bbc to actually support community radio whether it's with training access to facilities or whether it's even funding either director stations or paying for content and i, and I think there are opportunities out there um, and i think you know for community radio it is about sort of seizing the day really Ian Dale, presenter on LBC Radio. I think there's a real opportunity for community, community radio to expand now because you've got the BBC cutting back on local radio or what used to be known as local radio. It isn't really anymore. Um, and I think for people who want ultra-local radio, that's where, that's where community radio is. And I think there'll be a lot of investment opportunities for people to pour money into community radio. without, And it's, it's got to expand without losing what it's there for actually and that may be quite a difficult thing in, in some areas to do so there are lots of challenges but I think it's an area that is going to really expand over the next five years I think a lot of people in government imagine that the media is just a wash with money and therefore why should government step in in any way to subsidize anything and there, there is an element of truth in that um, but if you are serious about leveling up I mean community radio is actually a good place to start and if, if you identify areas that um, are that, that need coordination, that need to get people to do things in the local community, I mean, why wouldn't you then want to put a bit of money into community radio? The BBC gets, what is it, three and a half billion pounds worth of taxpayers' money through the licence fee. Well, you could argue that a section of that ought to go to community radio, particularly if the BBC is going to not fulfil its public service obligations and effectively pull out of local radio at least for 50% of the day. Well, I think the government have done a really good thing in what opening up community radio. And, um, I mean, Ofcom have always been um, seen as the roadblock to reform in all sorts of different areas. And if there are problems with Ofcom granting licences uh, or in any other way, then those need to be addressed through through lobbying local MPs. That's the best way to do it. Well, there's very little filter in speech radio because you, you can't plan what who's going to phone in. And, OK, the person who answers the phone is the only filter there is. They've got to make sure that the person phoning in isn't an idiot, has actually got something interesting to say. But apart from that, there is no filter. And in a way, 
you, you become really in touch with the mood of the nation. I mean, it's not scientific. It's not a fo- well. It is it, in a way. It's the ultimate focus group, isn't it? Because you're putting out a proposition and getting people's reaction to it. And if I put out a question to my audience and I give my views, I, I don't want them all to ring in and agree with me. This is one of the big fallacies of speech radio, where people always think the presenter wants to just have a bunch of adoring fans ring in. Absolutely the opposite. I want people to disagree with me so you can have a good debate. That's, that's what my type of programme is, is all about. It's quite difficult to, to ha- have a national radio station covering ultra-local issues, and that's why there is th- this gap in the market for community radio. I think that, I mean, for example, when we were a London-based station, we would cover tube strikes a lot. Um, do we cover tube strikes a lot now? We do in the news, but I would, I would be reluctant to do many phone-ins on a London tube strike. I mean, why would that be of interest to someone listening in Inverness? Or you could widen it out and do it on sort of trade unions and all that sort of thing. But it, it, ha- it does change your list of priorities when you know that you're, you're speaking to the whole nation. And therefore, you've got to try and make something interesting and relevant to everybody. Now, that's not always possible. And sometimes you will cover an ultra-local issue. For example, the Northern Ireland Protocol. I actually think that ought to be of interest to everybody, but it is kind of a local issue for Northern Ireland. But I, I, I will cover that because I mean, it does have wider implications. But w- would I cover the opening of a new of Everton's new ground in Liverpool? No, I wouldn't, because it's only of interest to Everton supporters. And yes, there are Everton supporters outside Liverpool. Um, it might it might make a something in one of the news bulletins but I'm not going to do a big phone in on something like that Um, Now something we were kind of mentioning earlier on this morning with Ian Dale, the deregulation of community radio is something that can certainly split a room Uh, and that's something we're going to continue further now with Rob Watson Uh, Rob is the host of the Decentered podcast an off-centred look at community social and sustainable media and we'll look into deregulation and what it could mean for the sector Um, he's joined by Martin Steer of the UK Community Radio Network I'm sure loads of people know Martin Uh, Sam Hunt of Leicester Community Radio and Joe Coleman from Brunel University London It says conversation, which basically means unscripted and unplanned. Um, But we have got talking points, which we've uh, figured out. And it is something which uh, is of relevance, given the conversations that have taken place this morning about deregulation. And a couple of conversations I've had today have indicated that people haven't got a clue what deregulation means or where it's being discussed. And maybe some people have more information. And what I'd like to do is prompt some thoughts with this short conversation and before I do I'm going to tell you timer on my phone so uh, I know that we can uh, go for 10 minutes and then we'll ask for questions and I'm going to be based outside this afternoon in uh, near the coffee come and have a chat with me and share your thoughts with it is the idea so if you've got anything and I'll put it together in a podcast and kind of the whole range of views that I think need to be represented in this and particularly with the kind of work that the UK CRN does, which is really important to have a voice within government policy development circles and others so that it's recognised the vital work that community radio does. So I'm going to start off with, I'm going to go left to right, and I'll start off with Dr Joe Coleman, who is from Brunel University. The The first question I've got is kind of the importance and the role of access and participation in community radio. What's your experience about how important that is? Hello. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so so for me, community radio is community access radio. And I think, obviously, those were the routes through which it became regulated and introduced in this country. So that means that you're providing access to the airwaves for people to have a go and create their own media and their own broadcasting and... um, expressing and articulating their own views and beliefs and opinions and sharing you know their understanding of the world around them and because we'd have local radio they can share their feelings about the place where they live and so for me community media is the way that 
local people can embed themselves more in their locality and, and feel like they belong more in their locality. And I think also the way people engage with community radio is different for different age groups or different stages of life and, and that sort of thing. But I think if we can create a system where there's community media, community radio there throughout people's lifetimes and as they move around, then they can, they can flow in and out as and when their needs change, I suppose. Martin, in terms of the work that the UKCRN does, that access, participation, direct engagement, one of the things I think always has to, I always have to remind people who are in the radio or media industries is that not everybody who gets involved with community radio, and I certainly don't, want to be part of the BBC or want to go and work for Black Bauer and Global um, because we just want to participate for the benefit of our own community, the circle of friends that we're part of, and talk about the issues that are relevant to us. So I've probably given you a leading question now, haven't I, <laughs> in terms of how does the UK, UKCRN uh, maintain a focus on that kind of approach? Well, actually, one of the hardest things with the UKCRN is, is that broad church approach to community radio, that there are lots of different models of community radio, lots of different ways that people want to do it. And for us, the challenge is actually trying to get everyone to say there is not exactly, there's no single right way and that we can all be working together and we can all be learning from each other. And it is that support network. Uh, supporting each other, supporting each other, sharing best practice, collaborating, but also making sure that the voice is not lost at government um, and with other stakeholders and making sure that the core purpose of community radio, which is about providing a different voice, a different platform to, you know, the commercial radios of the world, the local BBCs of the world, um, for local communities. And, and as Ian was saying earlier, you know, community, local radio of the traditional sense is almost non-existent anymore uh, and community radio can fill that gap but also let's not forget the community radio stations of communities of interest so you know youth stations lgbt stations um ethnic religious stations and niche stations uh, because if they've got an audience if they've got people that want to participate who want to be presenters and producers and and if they can fund it and if it's sustainable then why not? There's, there's a, it's a, a very big world in community radio and we should be welcoming everyone to be part of it. Sam, in terms of your experience in Leicester, which is pro perhaps one of the most diverse uh, places to, uh, to, to develop community radio, uh, that access and participation, what have you encountered over your time supporting stations? Uh, the thing is, is that most of the minority communities in Leicester, generally the minority communities aren't understood unless you're part of that community. So if you've got somebody like the BBC coming in, they don't actually understand it. We did a programme in collaboration with Five Live. It was supposed to be in partnership with Five Live for three hours. We were live on Five Live with them. What it actually turned out to be is the BBC interpreting and telling our presenters what to say, interpreting what the deprived communities were doing. We've got some of the most deprived people in the whole of the UK, and it was basically them using it and telling the story for them. But what we find is that by people telling the story for themselves and speaking to their own community, they can resonate in a far better way than BBC or commercial radio can. Now, we can talk about this for hours. Uh, in terms of access to platforms and uh, being able to get on AM, FM and DAB, would deregulation destabilise the... I mean, we don't seem to be able to have a regulator that moves very quickly and, and flexibly, I think there's a lot of agreement, <laughs> nods, of, nods of heads with that. But, uh, you know, Joe, in terms of your experience talking to stations, engaging with stations, you know, what would, you know, this idea of deregulation being an open process of deregulation, is that the right way to look at it? Well, it's mixed, isn't it? You know, like Martin was saying, there is no one model that's going to work. And I, and I was interested, I was saying to you earlier about this word deregulation. And you can look at it and think, oh, that's fantastic because it's going to release the shackles and we can do what we need to do to make our stations sustainable because no one's going to be breathing down our neck and, you know, limiting the amount of airtime we can sell or number of shows we can have sponsored or, you know, or where, where we have to have the station. So, so in one sense, it's a release, but then in another sense, deregulation could actually be scary because, because then we might lose 
what some of us might value as, as something and aspects of community radio that need to be protecting. But it's all relative, <laughs> isn't it? Because it's what, what we think our communities need and what we want to deliver. So deregulation might help in one sense or in certain aspects and not in others. That's a word that's come up a lot is protection because there are services that people provide that the market wouldn't provide and that the BBC, as Sam's just explained, you know, kind of drive-by reporting or, you know, kind of flyover reporting, if you like. It's kind of, how do we protect that? What is it that we uh, communicate back to government and DC, uh, uh, Ofcom that says, no, this is what we value? I think it's about what the core values of community radio is, so that access to platform for for local communities and for communities of interest or you know niche communities, and it is about that protection or safeguarding, so that you know I don't want to say you know bad actors or interests potentially bring the whole thing down. If we you know if we look at deregulating too much, you know the principles of community radio, you know being you know sort of community based on the whole volunteer driven or of, of of the community by the community you know there, there, some stations can drift from that and and you know the regulations can anchor that to me with deregulation is, a, is about access to platform though and that's where we need a much more agile regulator you know uh, that can very easily go with the times offer up access to platform very easily but also not getting too fixated on the future and you know, personally, I think, you know, FM and, and, and Sam would probably argue AM has got decades left to run. There seems to be this headlong, almost at a, a, a sprinting pace towards digital and the future. And there is an issue that that can leave some communities behind because they're not that digital. You know, so rural communities, uh, some minority communities, Sam will equally tell you about the, the deprived communities. They're, they're still bare and bones AMFM, and, and we need to protect and safeguard that as well as being agile and moving the, the, to the future. The, the regulation, Sam, has been posited on the basis that we've lived in a world of media scarcity, which is no longer true. And it soon won't be true for analogue broadcasting either. I mean, DAB increases a small amount of capacity for broadcasting, but it's really it's marginal compared yeah. to what you get on the internet. Yeah, mom. My day job is looking after transmitters, and I've just completed some work in collaboration with all of the licensed AM broadcasters, BBC Global Bauer, all of the community, all of the commercial, and most of the community AM broadcasters. And the consensus was actually arguing for full deregulation of AM. The uh, regulations we have date from the 1977 Allen Report, Martin's favourite one. He told me not to mention it. Um, <laughs> But basically, it was because they estimated there will be 20 applicants for each available frequency. Well, on AM now, we're looking that there are going to be 80 uh, available frequencies across the UK, and every area of the UK could have 40, free, 40 stations. And I'm absolutely sure that nobody in the room is going to be jumping out, some might, to go and put an AM transmitter on air. So in that case, the supply far outstrips demand. Ofcom has openly said they will not advertise AM for the foreseeable future because the licensing process is far too cumbersome for the return. So basically, there's never going to be any way to gain access to this AM spectrum, which is empty. So if you fully deregulate it with what we're saying, the only requirement is you actually transmit, you don't haul the spectrum, it will be um, self-containing, which is why you don't need regulation on the um, internet, for example, although we are advocating for content regulation. And the same why DAB, the DSPs and the CDSPs, aren't first come first serve, or some sort of do they get it or do they not get it. In terms of FM, however, going back to my hat with Leicester Community Radio, we've got no means to broadcast. We're not going to be covered by SSDAB where the audience lives, Ofcom's accepted that because of lack of frequencies. Uh, there's free FM frequencies available, but Ofcom isn't going to advertise them. Uh, but on the other hand, we're seeing BBC uh, Radio Leicester is going to cut all the afternoon programming, which we're very willing to provide. We've got the BBC pre uh, presenters who want to come to us. We want to provide that service. They no longer want to provide. Leicester Sound, for example, is now Capital Midlands. They managed to get an auto renewal in 1989. That licence has not been re-advertised since 1984. 40 years, and it in no way resembles the full-service ILR they got the licence on the basis of. We want to provide that, but we've got no means of being able to do that. So... 
the regulation to say you are providing a better service than them, we endorse that. So we don't want to see any further deregulation without it going to a full, open, competitive license round that we can bid for that and we can say, no, we want to provide the service you no longer want to. One of the things that seems to be missing from the present moves is any public value interest test. So the BBC haven't consulted with anybody about their changes. The Ofcom have allowed through consolidation with the commercial corporations uh, to almost go unchecked. And they've removed, I think you know, it was expressed clearly this morning, they've removed any kind of, you know, they're, they're kind of fake stations now and passing off things as local when it's not really as networked. What's the message and how, what's the next steps in terms of how we communicate with, you know, are we, if, is it going to take a change of government before we get a, which, which now seems likely, which when we've had these conversations in the past didn't seem so likely. But what do we, what's the message that we need to get through to the decision makers about how we, we do value this as a public good? I think one of the, one of the key points is UK CRM, we, we need to do more. Um, and we need to get more people involved with us. We need more stations to be, you know, part of us. Whilst we don't have a full membership model process at the moment, we've just sort of, everyone can get involved with us. We need more stations to say the UK CRN speaks for us because actually what, one of the big differences, um, I think what has crippled the sector for years is, you know, the radio centre, global. They're big companies, big organisations. They have big voices and a singular voice with government. You know, don't get me wrong, I would advocate all of you to make sure you're in open dialogues with your MPs to talk about and advocate for the power of local community radio. But actually what it needs is, when the DCMS are drawing up new, new legislation, you know, a voice at the table representing community radio that actually truly represents the needs of licensed broadcasting, community radio, you know, and, you know, UK CRN, all the directors are all, we're all station managers. We have, you know, our monthly meetings where we hear directly from station managers, what are the issues that they're facing now and in the long term? And that's the key is it's not looking two or three years ahead. We actually need a what does community radio look like in 10, 20 years time? And more importantly, not let the government dictate it to us in their, you know, their report they released not far off a year ago, which there was no engagement really in community radio on that. Last 30 seconds to Joe and then last 30 seconds to Sam. The, so the big concern for me is that increasingly anything local is deemed not viable. So from a business point of view, any marketing person or anyone who's looking at budgets, which includes, you know, the government, <laughs> is like, well, you know, and, and the example being set is BBC pulling out of local commercial have been pulling out of local, newspapers have been pulling out of local, leaving it to the grassroots to come up with their own models of sustaining delivery of a localised service. And so we, there needs to be more joined up thinking because levelling up and all of, all of the excitement about the rekindling of the importance of local during COVID, you know, we need to build on that and we need to be locally uh, hounding local representatives in authorities to encourage joined up thinking in the government and the way everything is distributed and, and the support frameworks for community radio. I think community radio is rather interesting. You've got a lot of things. I mean, um, uh, the UK CRN. And what I quite like about it is they actually seem to understand, for me, they seem to understand the needs of the minority communities more. And I think that's what the message we need to get carried away to government. I think you can get very carried away with this thing of, oh, look at me, I can go around the country and I can video all these podcasts and do this diary and whatever. But in reality, none of that matters to the man in the street who's struggling to put food on his table and in the evening, because they can't afford the electric and the electric's gone off and they haven't got the heating, they're sitting there in cold and dark. That's happening with our listeners. And the portable battery radio keeps them entertained. And it's that portable battery radio, the entertainment, which is what stops them starting to jump off a motorway bridge in some cases. And I think that's what community radio really does. And that's the true story that needs getting across. And Or another one which I think of, Radio Sira, a Muslim station, first generation refugees who've come to this country, they don't want to be in the UK. They want to be back in Syria. They want to be back wherever they are. But they can't be there because of genocide. So they've come to the country, but the community radio station is providing them a compass. It's helping them and it's that which is helping them feel like they're part of a community and those 
examples of what I see community radio does so well, but needs communicating so that the legislation can work for community radio and not fight it. So what I'd ask is, because uh, we're out of time, is um, contact your MP, contact your representatives, ask them. I, I think there's a really, really good question to, uh, to ask is, why isn't media included in the levelling up legislation? Because that talks about repatriating rights, resources and power back to local communities that have been left behind. So why aren't we doing that with our media? Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Kevin Scott and I'm the CEO of Hot Radio and Hot Gold in Bournemouth, Paul and Christchurch. I'm here today to represent our station and to find out and to socialise with other people within our sector uh, from community radio. There's a few key points that have been discussed uh, that I agree with in in sense. Uh, however, they're they're not so easy. So we're, we're mentioning that you know it could be one of the best sectors to invest in in community radio because the future is looking bright. I agree with that. Um, you do have some old organisations such as ourselves that are not for profit with no shareholding. We're not CICs. Uh, so in order to do that, there would have to be a company change. Um, but I do agree with that sentiment that it is a sector that definitely needs investment. Uh, that could be done through the EIS scheme where the government's currently, you know, we could get investors that way. Uh, but I believe it does need a lot of money and wherever that comes from, I hope that whatever government is in place moving forward, that they recognise this sector and support it massively as it is doing the job that um, sadly the corporates and the BBC in the future are going to be leaving behind. So my thought on deregulation is we are already governed, controlled by a system that is 30 years out of date. That is my personal opinion. I'm 54 years old. I'm not an 18 year old. But I do believe that the regulation that we have to experience is to blame for lots of things. So my first point on that is people mentioned listeners going to Spotify. If we're not truly representational of our younger people today, then they are not going to listen to radio. So the problem you have there is the compliance aspect because the rules that are, and regulations that are in place, the young people of today, and even me as a young person 40 odd years ago, use language and everything that's common day language today. But sadly, the governance is controlled by, in the nicest, politest possible way, a, society, a part of society that doesn't exist in the real world. That's my first point. Secondly, deregulation, how you can expect our sector to grow with regulation on income, on not being able to get commercial revenues is irrelevant. It should be scrapped with immediate effect. If you allow local radio stations to become networked nationally, they're not fit for purpose and they, they're no longer viable for the license they hold. I can mention many. Spire, in my area, Spire, Fire, Wessex, established local community, local radio stations that are now networked most of the time. They were licensed to be local radio. They should not be licensed anymore. They are not local radio, they are network stations. So to put restrictions in place to protect their revenues, to keep them local, now that they're not local and that has gone through and been accepted and licensed that they can now network their programming, the restrictions that are in place should have been removed at the same time. So we're already running behind. I know that the regulators and the people are under-resourced. I get that. So is every government department. But it needs a shake-up and it needs a shake-up yesterday. I have no idea why our media is not included in Level Up. The levelling up infrastructure, as you explained on stage, which is fantastic insight to that. Media has to be a part of that. If it's all about local and coming back to the roots of local, there is however many stations, 300 odd radio stations in this country that are local and truly local. 
they are the community radio sector. I like to call it local radio because the local radio that we knew it has disappeared now. So we are that. And it should massively be included. My problem with levelling up where we live on the South Coast is they said that the North was forgotten in the past. I have no... Uh, I agree with them in one sense. But what's happening is where we live in Bournemouth Pool and Christchurch is also being forgotten because they're saying, oh, we've got to concentrate on the North, but they're forgotten about the South. And we have our own problems and issues with funding. And uh, I think that needs to be addressed on an equal level across the whole country. Everybody, wherever you live in the UK, should be equal. And uh, that's my personal opinion, and it needs to be addressed quickly. Community radio is a voice of its local community. That is what it is licensed to do. That is what we are all about. We are run by and for our local communities. We might be quite a large community radio station where we are because we fill the gap where the, you know, the, 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 the other local stations are now not local anymore. We didn't ask for that. We filled that gap. However, we, did, we, we still run as a team. We are a big team of 112 volunteers, six staff now. We didn't want to be that big. We've become that big because there's people in media that have lost their jobs and wanted to carry on doing it as a hobby. We have become that big because we've had to employ a commercial department to keep us sustainable because of the gap we had to fill. We are a team of local people and we are a voice of the local community. We have every diverse sector of our community is represented on our stations because we have two and we need to be that voice in our local community and further afield. Okay, uh, Leona Fitzsum, I live in St Albans and I run a production company called Inkslingers Media and I'm also with Uni of Beds in the arts and culture team doing heritage projects. Yeah, and I'm not saying this because it's you, Rob, but I do feel your little panel discussion probably needed more time because it's a beast of a topic. And as you know, they had the Westminster Media Forum uh, Future of Radio and Audio conversation on Wednesday. And unfortunately, there were only two representatives from Community Radio, Vijay Amral from EVA and Sam Oliveira from uh, Reform Radio and myself, who's part researcher part also indie that works with community stations so yeah to me that's absolutely something that needs to be addressed we need to have more civic voices at these consultations and forums so yeah I would have liked to have seen that conversation extended on a bit more but then also the points that were raised how can we actually action them what can we actually do to get you know that heard in these settings because the people that were sponsoring the event were also like Arkiva, Radio Centre. So they're naturally always going to have an impactful voice, which I think was to Martin's point, one voice, one company. So how do we not necessarily dilute that, but plurality? How can we consistently, to your point, get all the wraparound diverse voices that are all relating to one particular area, which is radio? Yeah, you know what was really evident to me having spoken at Westminster was that we all come into these things with our own vested interest. That's absolutely a given and we can't shy away from that. So people's perspectives on deregulation will be based on what their ethos is and my ethos is to your point, community radio, social gain, capacity building, skills development, benefit of the community and that probably won't rest with people that have a commercial interest or a policy interest or DAB or in-car radio so how do we all meet in the middle or will we? Yeah, so that to me is the biggest challenge with the deregulation is you can't have people that aren't say within community radio not helping make that informed decision because ultimately community radio are either going to benefit or stand to lose from those decisions. Yeah, I, I'm in a real state of flux about this because I don't want to say it's funding. That can't be the solution because I don't like the fact that community radio constantly has to prove itself and shake the can. And as brilliant as the audio content fund was, perhaps there needs to be a community version of that so we can realise the potential and the capability in the community sector to generate their own original content relative to local audiences, but also how they can then use that to further generate income streams with their local businesses and organisations so they can subscribe and be sustainable. Yeah, so I find that a really hard one at the moment, to be honest. 
I think we almost need to get a bit radical, but not in the sense that we throw everything, you know, away. But for me, fortunately in Luton, I've been working with a lot more arts and cultural practitioners, and that's been great because I'm starting to think more unconventionally and starting to look how we can replicate models and ways of community engagement and ways of outreach, being more experimental. That is so valid in the arts sector, piloting things, prototyping, failing, and we just can't be linear when it comes to radio. We can't say, okay, this model has to be this bespoke model model fits everyone because it never will so maybe if we can take on that approach a bit more as well but I mean if I just disseminate it right down it has to be having a lot more community voices at the table in the room and being seen as a valid um, participant equal to all our commercial BBC policy friends. I mean with community radio it's always been quite interesting that we've always been tacked on to the end or as part of DCMS, which makes sense. We are media, but what community radio does transcends all of that. You know, it's it's social gain. Uh, you know, there's the famous saying out of South Africa that you know community radio is 90% community and 10% radio, whatever the saying is. You know, so there is a role that what community radio does cuts through to mental health and wellbeing services, cuts through to elderly and isolation support, cuts through to absolutely massively the levelling levelling up, you know, uh, DWP, all those kind of areas. And there isn't that cross thread uh, of what can community radio does at least not at a national level at local and regional level some stations do really well in some of those areas and we should be doing more to champion those as examples so that other areas can learn from that and then in terms of wider legislation we need to be thinking about the future we need to be thinking what's the next 10 15 20 years of community radio at the moment we limp by like every five years we have to have a conversation about what's the future so we can get another five-year extension for stations and i've always found that unfair when you know commercial radio for example can have i think it's 12 years automatic renewals and that's not the case for community radio and the bbc is allowed to just go on and on and on Um, and I think we need to make sure that community radio is protected and safeguarded um, particularly as we move more towards digitization I mean I know the uh, the commercial radio sector is 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 rightly asking questions about third-party gate holders you know uh, Amazon tune in these kind of things because they don't control those platforms and those are the platforms that are the part of the future and a big part of the future Um, and we need to make sure community radio is part of that conversation and that's where the UK community radio network that's you know part of our role and our obligation really is so that we don't let down the sector and make sure that the sector's voice is heard and actually part of the exercise this afternoon is talking about the future of the sector Uh, everyone's delegate bags there's a, a, a link to a survey that says right what are the key priorities that the sector that the UK Community Radio Network should be dealing with. You know, we are a sector-led organisation. You know, uh, everyone involved is a manager of a community radio station. You know, we have monthly meetings with managers. So we are in absolute direct contact with the sector. And and we always want to be guided by what does the sector want from us? um, And how are we, what are we doing to lobby and push forward the agenda of community radio? Because no one is doing that on behalf of Ofcom licensed community radio stations. And... We need to make sure that Ofcom license, which means something, it, you know, not to do down internet stations, they play a vital role. I mean, at the moment, I run another internet station as well as uh, a, an Ofcom license station. Um, but it means something different to be Ofcom licensed. And we need to make sure that going forward, those are safeguarded um, so that they mean something that has the protection. And, and whether that's continuation of FM and AM and more, li- I mean, I'd argue for continued licensing, new stations coming on air on FM and AM, I think for community radio, 20, 30 years, I'll be retired and FM will still be going, is what I see. We need to make sure that DAB and SSDAB works um, for community radio and there's a platform for digital. And then, like I said, we need to make sure that we're involved in those conversations about those third-party gateways, you know, the smart speakers and the tune-ins to make sure that community radio is safeguarded as well. So find out more about us, people can head to ukcrn.radio or ukcommunity.radio, it goes to both of us. Um, All Ofcom licensed uh, analog and SSDAB community stations should receive a quarterly magazine from us called uh, Connect, uh, which is free to send sta- uh, to stations. If other people want it, get in touch. And there's a subscription, you know, a couple of pounds a month to help cover the cost of it and stuff. So there's a regular magazine out there as well. We have monthly um, meetings that are open to managers and decision makers. And we also have a dedicated Facebook group, again, for sort of decision making and managers. Uh, whilst we want to be involved with every day, you know, presenters, producers, volunteers, our key 
audience for us are the actual you know, managers and decision makers who are working day to day in community radio and know what the issues are. And we were born out of those managers, out of lockdown with a peer networking group and managers deciding they wanted something for them uh, to come together and support each other. And, and that's the key point with the UKCRN is, you know, there's always another manager somewhere that's gone through the same issues that, that a manager might be going through that we can put them in contact with and they can talk it through. You know, so many problems have been solved by coming together and supporting each other and, and that is one of the key principles of the UK CRA. Uh, Jessica from Rock Raw Radio um, just set up a community well just looking at putting the application in for a community license um, we've won the DAB in Milton Keynes last Thursday so today I think has been quite nice and interesting day to come in and just have a look and talk to everyone and get an idea about where we want to go I think I think that's that's where we're at at the moment so um, lack of diversity <laughs> Um, and I'm going to say that normally I, I will be quite quiet about it, but I think um, I was hoping there would be a lot more diverse communities and, and there's so many community radio stations out there that are diverse. Um, whether it's not been fed out to those communities or whether those communities have come back and thought, oh, that conference isn't for me. Um, I think that's what we need to find out. You know, why is there a lack of people? I've only come in because I, I saw it on a, a, an email post that came up and I thought, oh, that looks good. Um, it had the community wards attached to it as well. So for me, that's something that I would like to look at doing something in the future and hopefully win something in the future as well. So for me, that's the reason why I thought was going to be a good idea and to meet other communities with similar community radio stations as me. But what I'm finding is that Community radio can mean something completely different to me. Um, I run an Asian radio station, um, but a community radio station in the general field is for the wider community. It's, it's for the whole county, but you'll have certain people that will just listen in. Um, what we're trying to do as part of the Asian radio station for Rock Raw Radio is to keep the element of Bollywood going throughout the whole station so the music is going to be Bollywood we've got so many different backgrounds and cultures but Bollywood is the generic music type that everyone loves um, and then build from there the local community elements so um, for example we've got a local charity a voluntary charity that deals with cancer patients she approached me and she said we tried to get more ethnic minority volunteers involved so I've said come and do a show once a week look at sort of um cancer related issues talk about those those things whereas a lot of Asian radio stations they will only bring the Asian community um, people down somebody from the ethnic background so I want to try and make it a bit more open so that the ethnic community can go and approach these individuals themselves and not feel oh I need to speak to another Asian person so there's a lot of work to do um, and I think today's been quite interesting to just put a lot of notes down I think the thing is as well, what I, especially sort of listening in, there, there are the two points. If we deregulate it, it can open up a lot of avenues for, for a lot of people. You know, um, I don't have to be sat in Milton Keynes to do my radio show, but have the knowledge of Milton Keynes. And I think that will open up a lot more avenues and even funding. You know, you don't have to be locally focused. You don't have to concentrate on your local businesses. You can approach the other businesses outside. And I think maybe somewhere along the line, Rock Roll Radio is trying to do that. Um, but trying to keep a, a local focus as well. And, and especially if we're online worldwide, you know, we should be able to tap into other areas, other countries really that are doing almost similar things, but pull their information to us as well. And especially with the Asian community, um, they may have to deal with mental health, but mental health is all over the world. You know, there's certain issues that everyone has to deal with, but just because you've got an Asian person on the radio, doesn't mean that their information and knowledge is going to be the same as someone else. So it's, there's a lot, I think, that I've gathered from today. Um, so it's at the moment, Milton Keynes is such a new place. There's no, been no Asian radio station there at all. The Asian community have just literally doubled over the last two, three years. The businesses there um, are reluctant, in a way, to advertise. They don't know what advertising on radio means because they hear of these larger organizations the larger radio stations and you know they might have an advert from Mercedes or Tesco's but how is that going to impact them you know if I've got a local butchers around the corner he wants to try and get more people involved um, and it's 
my role and the volunteers to go out and approach those individuals and say this is who we are build up that confidence and really just build up that trust and I think that's what it is at the moment the trust element at the moment um, and with all the community radio stations they need to build up the trust with the local communities no matter how big or small they are and especially talking uh, listening today about um, the key leaders in your area you know we're Milton Keynes I never sat there and thought actually I want to join forces with um, the Milton Keynes Museum but they're going to be absolutely you know great for the radio station so that's my first job I'm going to do when I go back <laughs> you've been listening to the Decentered Media Podcast with me Rob Watson to find out more go to decentered.co.uk or follow on Twitter and Instagram at Decentered Media Thank you.